So yesterday I was talking about the new MacBook Pros. Apple put out this eight core, very expensive new version of the MacBook Pro. Well, new old version. And in that video, I mean, I was talking about how powerful this thing supposedly is, but I was also talking about how for me, you know, I'm not going to buy one because of my previous experience with the butterfly key switches. Those exist on this model, just like the previous version. But then I was on Twitter and I came to find out that this repair program that exists for MacBook Pro's previous butterfly MacBook Pros is also already in place for the new one. So what that, what that means is that Apple is releasing a product maybe this is the first time ever with an active repair program in place for the product that people haven't even bought yet. So in other words, kind of admitting that there's an issue with their design before you've even purchased the thing, which is like 4,000 bucks, depending on the configuration you get. So it's a, it's a weird kind of admission that the design is flawed but we're not going to go back to the drawing board yet for whatever reason. We're committed to this particular design. Now, in Apple's defense, they say that they're using a new material, but they refuse to say what that material is. And for the record, in the past, they've said that changes have been made. Uh, I, of course, have the example of the 13-inch MacBook Air where they said, no, nah, there's a membrane there now that's going to protect the, the keys. But of course, that didn't protect anything on my particular MacBook Air. They also continue to say it's this select group of devices that are affected, but then, of course, in our own little test here in the studio and some others that we've read about, it appears to be more widespread than Apple is willing to admit. So this is affecting people in a couple different ways. Sticky keys, some people are getting the multiple key presses. Apple claims that they're going to have quick repairs for sticky keys. That's another kind of thing that's, a, that's weird to say unless you know that you have a design issue. Like quick quick repairs implies that you know there's going to be a lot of repairs. So this is a very odd development and just a quick, just a bit of an update, I guess, on this subject. If you do go out and buy some $4,000 new MacBook Pro 8 core, you're gonna have a repair program out of the gate. So I have no idea if that is, instills more confidence in you or less. I guess at least you have recourse if you were concerned about potentially having a sticky or malfunctioning key, but you you also are, are gonna be wondering what happens outside of warranty. You're gonna be a little concerned that if Apple themselves is aware of how many repairs are gonna need to take place in order to encourage people to take advantage of the repair program on a brand new product, then what's gonna happen after a year? What's gonna happen after two? Are you gonna buy the Apple Care? It's just worth knowing as a customer, if you choose to buy one of these things. That, of course, applies to both the 13 and 15 inch model. Catching up a little bit on the Huawei situation. Uh, you probably have read, you may know that Huawei is working on a, on a backup OS. But the thing about it is, well, what's confusing about any kind of backup OS is how would anyone accept it unless it had an active app store, unless it had the availability of the types of apps that people were looking for. So Huawei has this app store that they've been working on and they have this backup OS, but apparently this backup OS will also have the potential to run Android apps and, and the operating system could launch as early as this fall. So similar to what we saw in, in BlackBerry, you remember that there was a BlackBerry device, which still ran BlackBerry OS, but could also load Android apps, a select number of them. This That seems like a lifetime ago at this point, but this could be a solution for Huawei to get the best of both worlds here, where they could have their own OS with the protection associated with controlling their own code and not relying on a company like Google. But then at the same time, you could have the convenience of potentially loading up Android apps. I'm not sure how this would work from a licensing perspective as far as how, how uh, Google is concerned. But I suppose if you're an independent app manufacturer, developer, and you want access to the second largest smartphone company 
in terms of shipments, if you want access to their user base, you could then just take your same Android coded app and throw it into the Huawei App Store instead of creating something unique or, 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 or uh, custom for their App Store. That's what BlackBerry was banking on. Didn't go so well for them, as we know. But Huawei at this point, they, 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 have, they do have a successful product. They have a compelling product from a hardware perspective. Maybe in their case, this could be okay. Now, they're also stating that in order to improve performance, you could adjust your code a little bit for their custom OS, but it would be similar still to your original Android app. So anyway, that could launch in fall 2019, and I think it's a pretty interesting development in the ongoing Huawei story and where they end up. For the record, I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they're going to figure out a way. They're very big and successful at this point, and, and as we've mentioned in the past, they kind of are this uh, flagship, this this really important brand in China, tons of brand recognition. And I just, I don't think that they're going to evaporate because of what's going on right now. I think that they may just change. What do you think about the ARM chips um, with uh, them cutting ties with the Chinese brand? Yeah. So this, I mean, this is more on the side of the bad news again. <laughs> yeah. So here, here I am trying to have an optimistic <laughs> viewpoint on Huawei and you got to bring this up. Yeah. So... This is kind of predictable though, because this is is right in the same, right in the same wheelhouse as the uh, situation with Intel, Qualcomm, Broadcom, Google, and others. Uh, ARM is at the foundation of Huawei's Kirin chipsets, so they make obviously micro, tiny processors and chips. Following the news. Huawei reached out to Android Central with the following statement. We value our close relationships with our partners, but recognize the pressure some of them are under as a result of politically motivated decisions. Wow. We are confident this regrettable situation can be resolved and our priority remains to continue to deliver world-class technology and products to our customers. So just as Google, Intel, Qualcomm, and Broadcom cut ties with the Chinese manufacturer, now you can add ARM to that list. Is it permanent? Is it temporary? Are there these 90-day licenses? It's all, it's all so confusing and appears to be political, obviously. Not just to me, but also to individuals on the Huawei side. One interesting thing, publicly, Huawei doesn't appear to be blaming the vendors. They're not mad at Google. They're not mad at Intel, Qualcomm, Broadcom, and uh, even in this case, Arm. They, they seem, their statements seem to be like, we value our partners, uh, this is unfortunate. They're leaning more on a political end of the spectrum mm -hmm. as far as where the blame is being placed. So it's an interesting move. I'm just, the more I read about this, the more I feel like this is a temporary tactic that's going on with this ban. I don't envision it being permanent. And I think Huawei's going to find a way around it, whatever way that happens to be, whether the path forward is Android or something else. It's not going to be easy. And I definitely don't think that'll be the case. But the other thing to keep in mind is that there are other Chinese smartphone companies that are wildly successful that also carry Android. I mean, we've got, of course, Oppo, Vivo, OnePlus, that whole conglomerate. Those are out there. They're still properly running Android. You know, the interesting part right now is how transparent should carriers be in places like Canada that carry Huawei products? How transparent should they be to their customers that walk into the store and purchase one of these things today? Right here, we got Telus, Bell, Rogers. They all carry this device. Uh, in the UK, I tweeted this out this morning, EE, which is one of their big carriers, has opted out of Huawei devices. Now, with this kind of, uh, I tweeted it on the Lou Later account, but I may have retweeted it there. You can, you can find it if you're looking for it. Yeah, where is it? There it is. EE, a mobile network in the UK, has stopped its plans to use Huawei phones for its 5G launch. So they're backing out. Should you, as a vendor at this point, if you are a vendor that carries these products, should you be transparent with your customers and say, look, this stuff is going on. We can't state for sure exactly what's going to happen in the future with updates, with security, and things like this. Because for a lot of people, this is a significant investment. And it's got to put them in a really weird place, especially considering the fact that they already have stock. The whole thing is such a mess. It's really messy. I'm sure you already understand that at this point. But I think there will be some version 
of Huawei as we know it that is going to continue beyond this messiness. I just, I just think it's inevitable. Huawei seeks to reassure Canadian carriers in the face of U.S. trade ban. Yeah, so Huawei's been relatively successful here. Uh, I mentioned before, in Canada, in Canada specifically, a lot of promotion and uh, just the anecdotally, the, the public sentiment. People ask me about it, like, hey, I saw the commercial or I was in my local store. Like, should I pick one of those up? And uh, of course, I have a, I have a positive outlook on, I, I think they make great phones. I think a lot of the ones I've evaluated it have, have been on flagship level. So it's interesting to see the difference in relationship there between Canada and the U.S. And Canada has said that they, there's no plan to follow the ban at this point in time. So it's, uh, yeah, messy. Now, there are alternatives that already exist to the Google Play Store. And they exist for a number of different reasons, but they could possibly be operational in the absence of having access to the App Store and maybe being on the open source version of Android. So here are five Google Play Store alternatives for Huawei smartphone owners. You may forget this, but uh, Android, or sorry, Amazon. Amazon had, had an App Store, has an App Store. And the reason for that is because of the Fire products, Fire tablet and things like that. So I remember goofing around with this back in the day when I first tried those products out. And it's definitely not the Play Store, but it it has you you have access to some some relatively popular top tier apps in there. So there's one alternative. Next up, APK Mirror. Now this is, of course, you're gonna have to install these APKs yourself, and I have no idea how Huawei's gonna treat that in the future if they're gonna make that easier for you to do. But APK Mirror, I've installed apps like this. Uh, you recall I spoke about putting the Google Pixel camera app on the OnePlus 6T previously. Uh, I will pick up that APK. I believe it was hosted on APK Mirror. So that's another spot. There's a site called Get Jar, F Droid, up to down. I mean, there's many of these. A lot of people don't know this, especially people on the iOS side that might not be too familiar with Android. It's not, the Play Store is not the be all and end all. There are, are alternatives. And then Will's bringing up Huawei's own app store there as well. There are other ways to get apps on phones, especially in the Android ecosystem where you can install APKs, assuming that the manufacturer makes it relatively easy to do so, or you do some work yourself. So next up, Will, did you know that YouTube is changing how, dis how subscriber counts are going to be displayed, attempting to shift the culture? Now, we spoke about it here on the channel, but the whole world was speaking about it, at least tens of millions of people, the Tati James Charles beef and these real-time channels that get set up to track ups and downs in subscriber counts and, and sort of like weaponize subscriptions to turn it into some sort of a game. People obviously really enjoy that. Uh, it looks like maybe YouTube, who knows, possibly under the pressure of some of their uh, popular content creators, or maybe they just, maybe this is their own intuition here, but apparently they're going to change the way that subscribers are displayed. And instead of publishing the exact figure, they would round it out. Like, so for example, if you had 10 and a half million subscribers or 10.5, whatever, they would round that, you would see a flat 10 million instead. And then that would also remove the ability for third party sites like Social Blade to be able to tap into the API on YouTube and show this kind of real time figure because it wouldn't be updated real time. It would only be updated on those rounded off figures. So it takes away the game of weaponizing your subscription and watching numbers go up and down and having fun with that. Uh, now, this is obviously not exclusive to the James Charles Tati situation. This has happened in the past, uh, Logan Paul, others, where people just seem to get a real kick out of uh, <laughs> watching subscriber counts go up and down and participating in that kind of game. So this really could shift some cultural components of YouTube and how people view subscriptions and treat subscriptions. Uh, now, YouTube has apparently started to experiment with this, but it's not rolled out completely. A blog post from YouTube's product team acknowledges that subscriber counts are extremely important for creators, adding that the change is being instituted to create more consistency everywhere. Some channels already have this display function, but YouTube's product team wants to make it more uniform. So it sounds like it's happening, and companies like Social Blade are, I guess, in trouble. I don't really know what the purpose of them is in an environment in which subscriber counts are only up, are updating infrequently and where the real-time number 
Well, there is no real time number anymore because it's updated so infrequently. Now, I don't know how this will work on the back end. Like, will you still, as a content creator, see the real time number? Possibly, I would think so. But the public facing number will be this very uninteresting, rounded off figure. And, uh, and yeah, I think it, the implication there, I think it will change certain aspects of the culture of YouTube. So anyway, well, you got anything today? You got a story for us? You got something set up or we go straight to questions? What do you think? Um, just a quick one. Uh, yeah. If I can find it here. What do you got, Will? You, oh, were you right. ready for this show or what here? <laughs> huh? Were you taking a snooze, taking a nap over there? What do you got? So Ford's, Ford's two-legged robot walked packages to your door. Oh, my goodness gracious. Look at this guy. It's a bit scary. The but, future uh, of self-driving vehicle delivery, the future of Ford and transportation. Digit One is this guy's name. He looks kind of friendly. I like the color. They gave him like a cool sea foam. It's weird because I spoke about this color in a previous episode about the guitar that I wanted that was sea foam green. That's the color of this robot. He sees the obstacle. He's going to walk around it. He's walking near humans. He's relatively friendly. They didn't give him a head. It, it looks like his head is some sort of LiDAR um navigation tool like self-driving cars happen to have is this real this is not cg that's a real guy yeah that is cool the car company ford um they're the ones who developed it apparently it can hold 40 pounds right but obviously it has to be um in a car and then oh he gives out. props he also gives props yeah. did you see so that it part? can do that too he's got like a handshake after he gives you the package so did he show up in the car by himself that's an autonomous car that he gets out of? Yeah, hopefully that would be the future. The wow. car would be autonomous. Autonomous as well. car, autonomous delivery guy. It's incredible, guys. What do we need humans for anyway? Just, I mean, just to receive the packages. That's pretty much it. To mm -hmm. enjoy the proceeds here. Because that guy doesn't get a paycheck. I mean, you just pay for the production and, and how long? I mean, does you, you know, that's a weird thought. Like, how long does that guy work for you for? before he's out of commission can you get do you get 50 years out of a guy like that mm. of course i'm talking about a robot right now anyway yeah. that's cool that's very cool i like that and they did a good job of somehow making him seem friendly because in a way that boston dynamics certainly has not and no, maybe it's it's pretty freaky yeah maybe it's that he's on two legs it's his movements maybe it's the color too the color helps but i think it's also the slower more smooth looking movements the boston dynamic stuff it's jerky it's kind of it seems energetic it seems full of adrenaline yeah, robotic like a, adrenaline like a oh god it seems too potent so i don't even know what their latest one is this one seems a bit better but see even the legs are a little more like that episode of black mirror you know the one yeah, the um, killer robot. The killer robot episode. Yeah. I can't remember the name of that one. But yeah, they just, it, the Boston Metal Dynamics head. one just have a serious military vibe to them. They like, do, yeah. Marching towards you. They just don't seem all that friendly. That's a tough thing to do. You remember when we had the Sony robot in here? It was like, man, this thing is so friendly. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you achieve that? It's, uh, it's really interesting how we as humans perceive friendliness in the form of robotics. It's a lot to do with the, the movements, the way the motors are tuned. And like, he just has a really natural flow to him, the, the uh, Ibo, Sony robot dog. And there's something appealing about that where it acts as a better substitute for the real thing. Whereas I feel like the Boston Dynamics ones, they just, they seem like some new thing. They seem to be operating at some different pace. They seem like too electric almost. Yeah, geared towards like, the army or something that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying it's a strong military vibe cool story will all right should we get to some questions real quick yep all right here we go question big fan from india what do you think about india how big of a role do you think india plays in the future of the smartphone market you have been here before just curious what are your thoughts uh you have to answer this please <laughs> considering we are one of your largest viewer base you did australia come on yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, a lot of people might not know, people who, who don't publish YouTube videos, the tech audience in India is substantial. For myself, on, on various channels, India represents the second largest viewership, which is amazing, especially considering the fact that you're talking about 
uh, English speaking content. Here's a, here's a here's a little collab I did while I was in India, obviously sweating with the longer beard there and uh, trying some Indian snacks. But yeah, I had I, honestly it was a very eye-opening experience going to India. I I was able to meet a lot of Unbox Therapy viewers while I was in India and I came to realize that the enthusiasm for tech is kind of unprecedented there. It's uh it's unique. And it was a uh, the eye-opening component was the fact, I guess, that even for me, an outsider, an English speaker from somewhere else, coming there, I had uh, people were sort of view, uh, viewing me and the channel as this almost like traditional media would be viewed here. Like there was a, for, for example, this is not. I'm not trying to brag here. It's hard to say this without like. But I'm just. I was I was taking selfies with people for like five hours straight. Like I. I mean, that's a hard thing to say without sounding like you're bragging about it. But like people said they came from far and wide to to meet me. I and mean, I think it's just indicative of what tech represents as a concept in India. Yeah, I was at a I was at the OnePlus store. And I think it's representative of what of of the perception of tech in India, how it it's kind of this aspirational thing. It's this thing that many people strive towards. It's it's a it's a it's just in tune with the culture in a way that I haven't experienced elsewhere. And it's all, it also happens to be one of the biggest smartphone marketplaces increasingly. And so manufacturers are having to consider the Indian market way more than they've had to in the past. And in many ways, what works in India, like for example, OnePlus, their success in India helped propel their success, their success in other places. The Indian customer, the popularity there. You can see I was at the, I was actually at the store there. I mean, they have a OnePlus store there. There's no OnePlus store here. So it's a tech enthusiast audience. And it was a really cool experience visiting there. And I continue to try my best to, to keep a global viewpoint when I'm talking about smartphones and when I'm talking about brands and when I'm thinking of who the customer is and when I'm thinking of who the viewer is of watching this video because I recognize it's not just people here in North America. It's a global audience and it's, it's really exciting. We'll take one more question, Will. Hey, Lou and company. I just want to ask you one single question. Electric cars or no-go? I'm a no-go. He puts the question in the subject line. Yeah, that's how it gets my attention. Really. Yeah, that's not a bad move. It's not, but you're probably going to see a lot more of that now probably, that you said yeah. that. Once again, if you want to send your question into the show, just send it to will at lulater.com. Uh, yeah, of course, electric cars are a go. Tesla's had their issues. That's for sure. Man, seem like I, every day I'm reading some story about Tesla's cash issues and Apparently now all expenditures have to be signed off by Elon himself or one other guy. They're just spending too much cash. And man, making cars is hard. Making cars, selling cars, servicing cars. It's a, it's a whole thing. But I think Tesla has a good product. Of course, we had the Model 3 in studio and we drove it around. I think they have a good product. And I think that's, that's helpful. I think that's what matters. I think uh, they're gonna you know, they're gonna continue to unlock cash until the business side can be figured out. I mean, look at this website. This is a nice website right there. See, that's not easy to do. And actually, the Model X looks kind of good in that color. So Roadster coming out. Tesla, of course, not the only electric car option. Just the face of electric cars for the time being. But uh, <sighs> Porsche is coming out with another electric vehicle and with their very own electric vehicle, not another one. And apparently there's plenty of pre-orders on that particular car. People are excited about it. Other companies have committed. Ford has committed to investing more. They purchased that electric car company. I mean, look how cool this is, the Mission E. It's not going to look exactly like that, the production version, but very cool nonetheless. Uh, so, no, they're, they're here to stay. I think the no-go part is like it's taking longer than people had hoped for. It's going to be a longer period of time before these become ubiquitous and the standard just because of cost. If Tesla has showcased anything, it's hard to deliver these things at an affordable cost while still having a profitable company. So even though the Model 3 was supposed to be the answer, like the electric car for everyone, it ain't going to be the electric car for everyone if 
Tesla can't fix the bottom line. If they can't make them and make a profit, then it ain't going to last very long. So it all has to get figured out, but it will because the technology is good and the product is good as it stands today. There are advantages to it. There are still some advantages to the traditional uh, gasoline vehicle, primarily cost. Like you can, even with this thing starting at thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000, there's still cheaper cars to be had that are not electric and that's not going to change anytime soon by the looks of it. So definitely a go, just a matter of time. So anyway, that's a shortened version of the episode today. I hope you don't mind and don't worry because we'll be back because that's what we do. It's me and Willie do. We're in the house from time to time. We're in your house if you let us be there, whether you're washing dishes, mowing the lawn, whatever it is you got to do. Whatever it is you have to get done, we're here for you. We'll be in your ears or your eyeballs whenever you need us. Just let Willie do know. Send him an email and say, Will, I need you in my ears. I need you in my eyeballs. And uh, we'll do our best. There you have it.